my headphones. Um, okay, so my question is not only for this practice, it's more general for the Guru Yoga practice. When we visualize as a deity, first we visualize as a deity, right? But then in the moment that we visualize the Guru in front or above us, mm -hmm. how is that the Guru purify our oscurations if we are already the deity uh, itself? How? What do you mean by how? Yes, if we are already the deity, are you? The, are you? Are, no, of course not. But ah, uh, then, then, then the goal has work to do. As. You're visualizing yourself yes, as exactly because there's work to do. Okay, it's kind of the the sort of like the when we say the samaya beings and the uh, uh, yes, yes, sort of like that. yes, yes. Okay. okay. Yeah, throughout there is this tension. You're like, well, you're the Buddha. Why do you, you know, why there's a Buddha, you know, this Buddha and this Buddha? Well, yes, in theory, but not yet, you know? Okay. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cultivating the aspiration to, to Buddha. Cultivating the aspiration to be Buddha and cultivating getting used to that I am Buddha. Cultivating that, yes. And so then, it's, then the Guru in front uh, is like what ignites this experience. Uh, what ignites. The potential to become Buddha. Yeah, so I've spoken, so Judy said potential, so I've spoken of in terms of thinking What's here is the potential, what's there is the actuality. But even this potential is actually an actuality, like we are Buddhas. So the difference between Shakyamuni being Buddha and Han Lai being Buddha, Shakyamuni has completely removed all obscurations. Han Lai Buddha is still, you know, packaged along with the obscurations. So then, Shakyamuni can help Han Lai <laughs> remove the obscurations, the, the stains. So it's like gold and gold ore, right? This analogy is good. Like we are gold ore, right? That means uh, in order to, to, to end up with only pure gold, what do we need to do? Smelt it. And smelting is the process of burning away all that which is not gold. Now, when you do that, right, you're not improving the gold, really, right? You're not improving the gold. Gold needs no improvement. So in that sense, you as Buddha need no improvement. But if you try to sell gold ore, Per ounce is not going to carry the same price as your, you know, 999.9 .9 gold per ounce. Right? 
So therein is there is where the difference is. Okay, important thing is like these are methods, you know. These are methods. And methods, while it's good, right, to uh, try to understand the method better and be diligent about applying the method, right? But the method is not, is in and of itself isn't going to accomplish what we want. So then, what do we need? Uh, so this is a point that uh, Jigden Sungan especially emphasizes. So what do we need? Anyone? Tell me. Bodhicitta. Sorry? Bodhicitta. Bodhicitta. So what does that mean? Yeah? Bodhicitta. Okay. What does that mean? Motivation. Yeah. Well, yeah. Motivation. So what does that mean? Uh, desire, intention, what, what else? Diligence. Diligence, what else? Renunciation. Renunciation, yeah, I know, good, all of that, right? And, and what are you supposed to do with all those things? Practice the betterment of all beings. Yes, the betterment of all beings, but what are you supposed to do with it? Practice, well, what does that mean? Let's Say. Say. Hmm? Put your mind place your mind on the Buddha and be mindful of that. Place your mind on... Possible. Remember. Remember. Okay. Identify. Identify. What else? Understand, internalize those things. Understand and internalize. So, yeah. So, what? what's... what's What's this other aspect of practice that is really important? I mean, yeah, you've you got all of it. So now, now what? You're supposed to change. Hmm? You're supposed to change. You're supposed to change. So how do we do that? It just happens. It just happens. <laughs> Blessings from the Lama. Blessings from the Lama, yes. Please, please, please. <laughs> There's a connection between. Yeah, but you know, I think this is this is one issue that I think among people who practice Tibetan Buddhism, it's a little mysterious, you know. Devotion. Devotion. Yeah, what does that mean? Like accumulations. Accumulations. Yeah, what does that mean? Like, like, like. I know. I, you're all giving all the right answers, right? But then tell me, give me something concrete, like what are you supposed to do? Hmm? What are you supposed to do? Identify. 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 Identify how? Say more. Um, uh, cultivating the, the qualities and the state Cultivating the qualities, identifying the faults. Uh, someone is typing, typing, typing. What, what's going on? Can someone read? It says, "Let the Buddha qualities arise." Let the Buddha qualities arise. Uh, yeah, but how? <laughs> Avoid the ten non-virtues. Practice the. Avoid the ten non-virtues. Practice the ten virtues. And watch the mind carefully, you know. So it's a day-to-day -day thing. All of that, if only if we really commit ourselves to watching our mind carefully, watching our body, speech, and mind, watching our physical actions, verbal actions, mental, emotional actions. Only if we are diligent in doing that, 
then when we perform the sadhana, it can work. If we only perform sadhana, you can do it for a thousand years, I can tell you. It's, nothing is going to happen. Why it is so hard to feel like a Buddha <laughs> when you visualize Medicine Buddha, right? Mmm, Medicine Buddha, right? <laughs> Why it's so hard to actually feel like Medicine Buddha? Even sometimes you think, maybe I should like, you know, get paint and paint myself blue. Right? Because you know we've not been good. Yes. We've not been good, exactly. Right? <laughs> this morning I was yelling at someone, you know, while coming here I'm thinking all these thoughts about that person. You you cannot pretend that, you know, those things are not there. So sometimes I think myself also at fault in teaching as if, you know, and, and I don't want to say what other people are doing, you can think, you know. I think one, one, one problem is I think you attend these teachings, you know, and then the teachers teach about this practice, that practice. It sounds like magic, you know. Oh, recite this mantra, you know, a million times, you become enlightened. You know, you come across these kinds of things. I think it's very common in Tibetan Buddhism, but when you look at Kyoba Rinpoche's teachings, he doesn't have a lot of details about in front is this, in the heart there is that, inside the heart there is that, inside that heart twirling around the <laughs> syllable, you know a bunch of other syllables, you know, turning left side, turning right side. He doesn't have a lot of things like this. He has, yeah? I'm not saying that he, he doesn't use these techniques. He is familiar with these techniques. But in his instructions that we have translated so far, you see this common theme, and, and we chose the things randomly. Like at least my, my group of translators, our randomness is in the area of look for the shortest things possible to translate. Because least likely to get stuck, then we can at least say, we got this translated, we got this translated. So our random sampling is short. But other people have also done middling things and long things. But when you read whether it's short, middle, or long, you will see that he continuously say, but you have to change your mind. And as for that work of changing the mind, there is no magic. You can twirl your prayer wheel until it flies off. It's not going to help if you are not determined to change body, speech, and mind. But when you start to change, to, to, to be serious and to be committed to changing body, speech, and mind, then Om Mani Padme Hum becomes powerful. Then knowing when to ring the bell at what point and play the drum at what point becomes powerful. Why? Because it's w working on, right? The power of, we say, these sounds are not random sounds. These sounds were given by uh, those who can see the interdependence okay. that it can. It's like uh, it's like the yeast, you know. But but we need the flour, we need the water. Uh, the methods, right? All these practice methods or all these formal practice, yeah? they, they are yeast. Yeah? And if you have a lot of yeast but you don't have food to feed the yeast, 
it cannot you have it cannot get bread And, and method may not even in the end be absolutely necessary depending on each individual circumstance you know like, uh, method it's like, methods uh, like chanting mantras doing prostrations you know of course in the tradition many people have done that yes but it may not be I say, not that it's, you don't need, but you don't need a lot of yeast to make good bread. Can I see if I understand yeah. a little bit? Uh -huh. Is it, so like, is it from the sense that like we mm -hmm. can taste something that's very sour and be like, oh, that needs sugar. Yes. But because we understand that, in, that dependence, yes. we can taste it. Yes. But someone, the guru, uh-huh understood it in the interdependence that we don't see yes. as easily. Yes, so correct. They developed methods right. for us to be affected by it, but we don't have to. Correct. Okay. Okay. Yes. So so the gurus of the past, through trial and error, yeah. right? And they have seen how by introducing just a little bit of this can help you like break through. But the thing is, we are learning all these potential to break through, but we don't do the work for breaking through. Then it won't work, you know? So it's to just say we want to become Buddha uh -huh. is missing the step of realizing what we have to do, i.e. my change. Yes, to just say I want to become Buddha, to just say even uh, oh, all mother sentient beings, boundless as the sky, especially those enemies who hate me, all threats who harm me, la 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 la, right? You're missing something. You're missing something, right? And to visualize, okay, now, yes, I want to be Buddha, oh, medicine Buddha, blue in color, la la la. Not? not really going to do much so then they say at least during that time you are not thinking that you're a demon <laughs> so some benefit at least during that time you're not thinking how am i going to go beat up this person therein lies the danger of wrathful deities that you think you know and in fact you're thinking I'm gonna go beat up all those people who don't agree with me you know, because I'm now a wrathful deity right dangerous at urban Dharma you don't see a lot of I, I don't <laughs> yeah we don't have wrathful deities represented for the moment yeah, no, we don't have. Thank yes. You. For me, you know, when you are just kind of lost in thought, uh -huh. sometimes the mantra will just come into your mind. Yes. Unexplainably, right? Yes. And then that is the, re it coming into your mind is the reminder to, you know, have the right speech, right action. Right, right. So, so, yeah, so what Emily is saying is that for her, you know, sometimes she's lost in her own, like, confusion or samsara, and then the power of mantra comes through, right? You suddenly remember the mantra. But as you said, if it just stops there, then it's just random sounds. But then when you hear Om Mani Padme Hum, you remember, oh, love and compassion. Ah, now that yeast is working. Now, otherwise, it's just like, you know, the gurus and the the lineage masters are continuously like sprinkling right yeast on you but there's no flour <laughs> you know there's no sugar to feed on then you're covered in yeast you know <laughs> but yeast on stone yeast on sand wasted that, that's the paying attention 
part two of the awareness in your mind to allow that to come through. awareness in your mind to allow that to come through yes so we make that effort you know so don't think of your practice as just this practice where you work where you eat where you volunteer where you pay bills all of that uh, but don't walk around like <sighs> just be natural you know but but follow the dharma into uh, your life that's where the mind is changing then more and more mantras can come and remind you more and more you will remember I am medicine Buddha then you don't even need to force I'm looking for a teaching that uh, someone else translated it's a teaching on um, the winds how to control the winds you know uh, because again and, and, and and when this Lama taught recently uh, in Chicago, not recent, like maybe during the pandemic, uh, Lama Dubon uh, Mejen Dorje, you know, taught this one text, Kyoba uh, Rinpoche's text, and the title of the text is like, how to, I don't remember, there's a, there's a fancy name to it, like the Udumbara flower, like it's a very rare flower, uh, but it's instructions on how to control uh, the psychic winds so to say yeah I still remember you know when they announced that uh, this teacher is teaching this I'm thinking hmm, I don't know how many people will actually benefit from such things you know but, but I didn't see the text yet then when I finally saw the text I'm like ha ha it's, it's killed by Rinpoche again it's dependent them again. Basically, in that text, he, he says he talks a little bit about, and you know he knows these things because he practiced them. But he only said a few things about when it comes to actual what you do, you know. And I think a lot of people are expecting, oh, he's going to tell you, you know, block this nose, breathe in here, you know, insert that wind there, this and that. No. Instead, he says, you know, you know where winds get stirred up? Winds get stirred up by your 10 non-virtuous actions. You don't want the winds to be disturbed? He says, I tell you how you can stop them from disturbing you. You stop creating the 10 non-virtuous. <laughs> and even like, Towards the, end of, towards the end of the text, he says, you know, I know some of you are complaining, saying, no, thank you, I did not ask for these teachings, why are you telling me this? <laughs> he even says that, you know, in that teaching, he says, you know, some of you are now thinking, you know, wait, this is not the teachings I requested. He says, other than this teaching, no other teaching will free you from confusion. He says, all these techniques that you, are, you guys are so interested in. He says, you think they are going to save you. No, they're not going to save you. But developing the Dharma within the context of our lives, right? Then all these practices that we do can become powerful. Even he says, you know, like, if you try to control your mind, focus, 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 right? And, and you think, oh, if I hold my breath, focus will come. He says, yes, maybe, you know, but it's forced. How do you, how do you bring focus? How do you establish uh, nyamsha, uh, resting in equipoise? How do you rest in equipoise? He says you have to develop a determination to be free. 
you have to see what are the faults of a mind that is wandering around, not under control. Huh? The, the, the harm that such a mind can cause, you need to see that. You know, you need to see that. And how can you see that? Pay attention. Where we work, where we pay bills, where we drive, where we commute, where we serve, where we are being served, all, all there, you know. Questions, comments? <laughs> is so helpful to me to, because I'm very guilty of trying very hard to be Buddha. Know it. Uh -huh. Trying very hard to be Buddha. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and knowing that I'm not there. But I mean, I know that's, that's not what I'm trying to say. Yeah. Knowing that I had a, a thought that wasn't necessarily... A Buddha-like thought. Yes. Yes. And it doesn't really work. It doesn't really work, yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yes, Joe. Uh, I just want to like, you know, the other view of it is like, you know, you, you come here, your day was very mundane. Mm -hmm. and then you do have a chance to like, Suspend your disbelief to borrow the language, you know, and to enter in a, in a realm yes. that is, oh, yeah, that's, I got, I remember again. So, of course. You have that to remember. Of course. Yeah. And that's the method. Yeah. Right? I'm not saying, like, okay, I'm not, like, you know, trying to shut down Wednesday nights. Right. <laughs> oh, don't need, I'll go home now, right? No, then I'll be out of business. I should be careful using the language of business. Then somebody says, <laughs> the tons of money he's making. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Just to be clear, you know, no fees are being charged by anyone here. We just have to pay the landlord. <laughs> Which is about 4000 a month. It's our expense here. Uh, <laughs> So, yeah, Joe, you're right, you know, like, so, so then the, the, we also have to appreciate once a week we gather here, yeah, we ring the bells, we play the drums in a very precise way, in a specific way, you know, uh, we train in this. Yeah, this is how it can work. But it can only work if we remember that this is like, what's, what's an analogy to this? Um, fermentation. Fermentation, yes. Yeah. Or this is like, you know, right? you, 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 it's like you cannot just come to the gym once a week yeah, and not be disciplined whatsoever for the rest yeah, of your time you know like you want to be a complete you know like don't want to do any physical exercise whatsoever and you just come once a week for two hours and then think I'm going to be <laughs> build up core strength no it's not going to work you know all the other areas of your life you have to Pull it all together. Yeah. Then the ferment here. And likewise, right? This experience here, when we do this practice, or when you at home, you should do. You sh if you can establish a session of just 20 minutes, but don't underestimate your 20 minutes. 
If it is just 20 minutes and then the rest of the hours you don't care about the Dharma, you don't think about the Dharma, you don't bring the Dharma into your life, yeah, then that 20 minutes not really useful. But that 20 minutes can be very effective if throughout the day you keep checking in with the Dharma. Then that 20 minutes. Not only is that 20 minutes going to be like you know, like the relief, so to say, that you need, but you will find that in those 20 minutes, you, you can actually experience yourself as Buddha in a more authentic way. Because you can't, you know, you, you can't like kid yourself. So if, if that day you have been watching your mind, very well. Then that evening of 20 minutes, it all comes together. Ah, so this is the skillful means. This is the method. This is also why Vajrayana has this claim. Let's say that where Vajrayana has an advantage is superior methods. That's also the Vajrayana claim to fame, or at least it claims it for itself. And it says that it has superior methods. And Kyoba Rimuchi, Jiten Sumun says this. Yes, Vajrayana has superior methods. And without these superior methods, it will take a much longer time. He does say that. And Buddha does say that, you know. But we got it all wrong if we think. Huh? Just those methods if the basic ingredients are not there. So we gather those basic ingredients, and those accumulations that we were talking about, you know. What are those basic ingredients? Those basic ingredients? Mm, presence, paying attention, understanding where suffering comes from where happiness comes from, seeing the faults uh, of suffering, seeing the faults of the afflictive emotions, like seeing, really seeing the faults, recognizing this is suffering. So those, and then working on it, right? Basic ingredients, what are the 10 non-virtues? And, and why are they non-virtues? You know, why is killing a, virt uh, a non-virtue? Why is stealing uh, a non-virtue? Uh, seeing those faults. Seeing the faults of attachment, you know. Not like being indoctrinated into not having attachment, but really seeing, you know, is attachment heavy or not? You know, is entanglement heavy or not? It's heavy see more clearly, see more clearly. Then there are more and more subtle levels of the mind, you know. At the, at the, at the beginning level, the more obvious things, uh, you, you, you begin to see better and better. Uh, all the obvious things that are causing suffering for you, causing suffering for others. Uh, so then you naturally become less and less interested in creating those causes. Then there are more subtle forms of suffering that are still being created on a more subtle level. And then you get into more, more, then you need to do more uh, seated uh, meditation to bring the mind back. Then you can use mantra, uh, the more formal practices, but, but only if you know how to use those formal practices to bring your mind to come back and watch what it's doing. So, so this practice, the, the, the mantras being a mechanism to sort of break cognition, so to speak, mm -hmm. create a space. The yes. space then is what is filled with the, the, the basic ingredients. You said the visualization yes. holds the space. The visualization can hold the space, the various methods, yeah? Create the space. 
space. And then yes. the, in the space that's held by the visualization, that is where the something can happen. of those ingredients and something can yes. happen. Yes. The, the sublime is there. Yes. The sublime is there and, and it creates a temporary kind of, you can say, uh, a, a lab, right? A control environment. But the whole point of the control environment is so that your other 24, 23 hours of your life, it's it's happening. You create the environment, then eventually, slowly, you live in the environment. Yes. So uh, ideally, you identify, you flip. Yes, you flip. So, so, so they say, you know, how now our if you are if you are very serious dharma practitioner, right? Your life is divided into meditation and post meditation. Yeah? The same. Meditation and post meditation. If you're a very serious Dharma practitioner, your life is your, your life is divided into during meditation and post meditation. Meaning and there they actually mean on the cushion, off the cushion. So right now, on the cushion, very small, off the cushion, very big. So they say, but you want to practice to a point where there is no on or off cushion. It's always on. Always on, whether you're actually sitting. Yes. Three postures. <coughs> yeah, always on. Don't practice dharma, you know, like it's some kind of shamanic <laughs> magic. <laughs> so easy to do that. It's very easy to do that, yes, especially in the Tibetan tradition. Yeah. Less, less easily so in other traditions because there's less, but, but part of the, you know, style of the Tibetan is that, you know, not, it's not a Tibetan creation, this is just the Vajrayana element, which recruits a lot of magical things. And that's also where we say it's superior. If you don't not realize what is going on, kind of. Say that again? If, if, you, if you just assume it's magic, Yes, if you just assume it's magic, it's not going to work. It's not going to work. So you have to see it, but recognize it as a different process. Yes. Yes. Would, would they have said it like that? Would they have said it like that? Who they? Like, um, you know, a thousand years ago in Tibet. Uh huh. Yeah, if you have the right teacher. Yeah. Uh, the, the majority, you know, are doing what we call accumulating merit. You know, just getting yourself to a better place, but not, not really plumbing, yeah? uh, like into the depths going into. Uh, there are lots of stories like that, you know, uh, like like lessons, you know, given through this. Uh, one is like, uh, you know, someone is sitting there. Uh, I think this story is told of like Atisha and sometimes it's Gampopa. Mm, but whoever the characters involved are, basically a student uh, is, is doing like a uh, circumambulating a stupa, you know, which is, you see many people doing this, you know, walking around the stupa, reciting mantras, a uh, teacher comes and says, what are you doing? He says, oh, I'm circumambulating stupa. And the teacher said, oh, that's very good, very good, but uh, you should practice the dharma. Student thought, what? I thought that's, I thought what I'm doing is practicing dharma. 
So then he 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 goes, hmm, I guess maybe what I should be doing is something more serious, you know. Then he does prostrations around the stupa, you know. And the teacher comes and said, well, what are you doing? He said, oh, I'm doing prostrations around stupa. The teacher said, oh, that's very good, very good. But you know, even better is if you practice the dharma. Yeah, so it goes on, you know, into now he's meditating very seriously, you know, like, oh, look, le looks legit, you know. And teacher poke him and go, hey, what are you doing? So well, I'm meditating, you know. Like, like this is supposed to be like the highest, right? The most impressive. I'm now in a 10-day Vipassana retreat, you know. And the teacher is like, you know, better to practice the Dharma, actually. So I said, what is that? Change your mind. All those things are methods to change your mind. But if you forget that you, you in the end have to change your mind, these methods are not going to change it for you. Yeah, just walking around and around a stupa is not going to change it for you. When you are determined, I, I want to change. And here is how, how I have to change. Ah, then reciting mantra, right, becomes effective. Effective for what? For changing. Not effective for, you know, oh, medicine Buddha, I will not fall sick ever again. No, the Buddha died of basically dysentery, food poisoning. Now what? <laughs> One of his disciples, famous for among his all his disciples, like each of them, there's a group of close disciples. They are all well known for one, like one aspect. And one of them, the one that is known for his supernormal powers, his ability to appear, disappear, this and that, right? He was beaten to death. Yeah. He was beaten to death because of ripening of a karma. So, so his enemies kept chasing him and he kept disappearing until finally he, he goes what is this? why, why do they keep you know, chasing me? Then, then he used his clairvoyance and he saw it's a karma that he created in the past that even though he has purified all that he could that he's already an arhat but this one last karma he has to let it ripen. So then he stopped running and they beat him to death. But he didn't suffer, you know. He didn't suffer. So, question is, are we going to suffer when we get beaten? Are we going to suffer when we get fired? Are we going to suffer when we get ditched? Are we going to suffer when we get stood up? Are we going to suffer when we get insulted? Are we going to suffer, you know, when we get rejected? All those things are going to happen in your life, in my life. You may or may not be able to avoid those things, but for sure you're not able to avoid them at all times. So that's not what the Dharma is for. The Dharma is for, are you going to suffer when those things happen? How much are you going to suffer when those things happen? <laughs>